attendees and any registered attendee unable to join today will have a link to the uh, recordings. For today's schedule, I'll do a quick introduction to ASD and then we'll get into the presentations. At noon or at the conclusion of Dr. Redinger's presentation, we will serve lunch in the conference room to the left as you exit the auditorium. And the next presentation will start at 1 p.m. and then we'll take a quick coffee break around 2. Once all the keynote speakers have presented, we will conclude the event for the day and take any questions you would like out in the hall. As any event uh, that incorporates multiple speakers, we may experience challenges with the integration of uh, presentation formats or other technical issues as you've already seen today. Uh, so please bear with us while we address them so we can start promptly after the issues are resolved. And so, Let's get started. Uh, who is ASD? ASD was founded by two renowned remote sensing scientists, Dr. Alexander Getz and Dr. Brian Curtis. And Brian's actually a speaker presenting here today. They established ASD to address a fundamental need of earth science researchers to have a robust, high performance, portable instrument that could be used in field work. Our organization specializes in near infrared technology used for material identification analysis. ASD, or Analytical Spectral Devices, was incorporated in Boulder, Colorado, where we currently have our headquarters. We also have a large remote presence with sales representative agents and distribution partners located all over the world. ASD is now a panalytical company. This was effective in July of 2013. Panalytical has expertise in leadership in X-ray instrumentation and services. Their goal was to add ASD's expertise and leadership in NIR spectroscopy to create a combination for a full spectrum of measurement solutions from one global manufacturing and service organization. With over 3,000 instruments in over 70 countries, there's a global presence of researchers using ASD instruments. And we are videotaping today's events in order to share these presentations with many of our interested out-of-country registrants. Today, ASD is innovating and addressing customer need by providing the latest technologies combined with the highest standards of quality and measurement. We continue to provide customers with value-enhancing solutions to their material measurement needs by offering resources of instrumentation for field, near-line, and online material measurements, application and expertise supplied by our Summit Cal Solutions team, and service and support for installation and post-sale support worldwide, including service centers, in the Netherlands, Brazil, China, and soon Australia. ASD instrument lines include field spec for remote sensing and field research work, the TerraSpec uh, line for mining and exploration production, the quality spec line for online and near line process control, and the lab spec for material inspection and identification in the field and lab. ASD offers several spectroscopy software options for our customers. Our in-house spectrometer software includes data acquisition and analysis tools for remote sensing and <coughs> industrial applications. Third party software options include those for mineral analysis, data processing, and chemometric modeling. We offer a comprehensive variety of accessories such as our contact probes to meet a multitude of application requirements. Please visit our product section on our website at asdi.com if you'd like to learn more or you can ask me as we have time today. And now, please allow me to introduce Dr. Brian Curtis. Dr. Curtis is one of the founders of ASD and currently serves as ASD's Chief Technical Officer. He has over 30 years of experience in the fields of geology, spectroscopy, and optical remote sensing. <laughs> He received his bachelor's degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Washington University in St. Louis, and his master's and PhD in geochemistry from the University of Washington. His postdoctoral research was at Caltech, where he assisted in the development of field portable spectroscopic instrumentation. Prior to joining ASD, he, was, he held a research faculty position at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and in his current position, Dr. Curtis applies his experience to a diverse range of analytical problems in the area of remote sensing and natural resources. Brian will now be presenting on a new release of ASD, the Field Spec Dual Collection Software System. Right. 
<laughs> oh, I need to go. Okay. So here's where we appreciate your patience. <laughs> well, let's get rid of that and let's see this forward. Well, So I'm just going to give also a little history about uh, software that, that allows use of, of two spectrometers at once. Uh, and the, the, the main problem is, is making field measurements on days that have less than ideal conditions. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, on days where you don't have a perfect blue sky, horizon to horizon, uh, you, you have conditions where the light level at any given point in the ground is changing uh, with time. And even on days when there aren't clouds in the sky, you can still have uh, time-varying water vapor, which changes the, the uh, solar irradiance uh, as a function of time. And when you normally make measurements in the field with a single instrument, uh, you're, you're measuring, a, say, a white reference panel at some time, and then at some time later you're make, measuring a sample. And you're really what you're doing is making two radiance measurements and then ratioing those to get reflectance. And inherent in that assumption is the assumption that the irradiance hasn't changed between those those two measurements. Uh, and, and clearly, if you've got you know certainly conditions like in this photograph, or even on a day where there's just like time varying water vapor, that, that isn't true. And so what you end up with is a reflected spectrum that has, uh, has uh, a bias in it that's related to the change in, in irradiance between the time you measured the white reference uh, in the sample. So what this means is that typically people wait for these kind of perfect days or golden days to make their, their field measurements. Uh, and that really limits the number of days when you can perform field work. Typically, for a lot of, especially if you're trying to do field work uh, here in the in the Northeast, you might allocate uh, several, two or three weeks uh, to do field work. You're making other measurements on, on many of the days, and you're, you're hoping for that one perfect golden day where you just, you're out running around as fast as you can collecting spectra because that's the day. Um, so if you have uh, uh, two spectrometers, you can you can hook them up together. Uh, in back in the early days, we would do this by building the two spectrometers into the box. Uh, but these days, you can use uh, you know wireless networks uh, to allow one computer to talk to two instruments. Uh, one of the things that that has been shown to be really important any time you do this, though, is that you really have to intercalibrate the two instruments. Uh, both on the, the X scale and the Y scale, because if you don't, all kinds of errors creep in. And, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. But the real, the real key here is to be able to collect near simultaneous uh, radiance measurements of both your reference panel uh, and the target. Uh, it doesn't, this doesn't take care of the, the other part, which is uh, distance, if you're, because the, the irradiance at any point varies not just with time, but if you are measuring your white reference in a different location, then your, your sample has got that, that to deal with as well. Uh, but certainly, in, in many cases, the, the time varying component is, is, uh, is dominant. And then, and then lastly, and this is really more of a convenience, if, if you can, if you can uh, uh, process and display the data in real time, you can give feedback to the per person making the measurement uh, that in fact the data you're collecting is, is, is good and of high quality uh, as opposed to you know, finding out later on. So a little history. Uh, the first uh, dual instrument that, that ASD made was back in, in 1996, and it was actually there were non-commercial versions uh, quite a few years before that. We, in the early 90s, in I think 93 to 95, had a couple of, of uh, uh, kind of research instrument development uh, uh, grants from NASA and the Corps of Engineers to make dual spectrometer systems that just covered the, the, uh, the Wiener range, so 350 to around 1,000 nanometers. And these systems were for kind of special cases 
the, uh, the, the instrument for the uh, Corps of Engineers was for the Coal Regions Research Lab in, in New Hampshire, and their application was measuring sea ice optical properties. Uh, and they, the way they had been doing it is they would measure the irradiance above the ice. They would take that sensor, put it below the ice, measure the irradiance again, and from the ratio of those two, uh, get the transmission of the, uh, of the floating sea ice. Again, that would only work when irradiance was, was stable. Uh, so they had a lot of days where they'd go out and they couldn't make measurements. So we designed a system that, again, had two uh, uh, silicon array spectrometers that allowed them to simultaneously measure those, those two uh, light fields. We did a, for, the, for NASA, it was for uh, the CWIS program. This was pre-launch. But it was a, a, an underwater instrument that was in a pressure vessel that also had two spectrometers, one that was measuring downwelling irradiance and the other one was measuring uh, upwelling radiance and it was meshed, uh, built into a pressure vessel and they could, uh, they, this, this was lowered to the water column then measured the, uh, the upwelling radiance and the downwelling irradiance as a function of depth. And they used that to, to uh, uh, calculate water leaving radiance. And during that time, there were some NASA researchers that, that developed some algorithms uh, to derive water leaving radiance from above water measurements. But again, those measurements required uh, measurements of the radiance reflected off the water, the radiance from the sky, uh, simultaneously again, because again, uh, when you're out on a ship and you get to uh, uh, each of the stations where they're going to make measurements, uh, you have a certain amount of time and you can't wait around for a perfect blue sky day. You have to make measurements on whatever the conditions are. So we ended up kind of commercializing the, the instrument designs that were done for that research into the first field spec duel, and that was in 1996. And then when we came up with the field spec pro in 2001, we kind of carried that over. This is a picture of that instrument. You can see the two fiber optic cables coming out there. Now, those um, those instruments were used primarily for, for ocean color research. Uh, and there are, there are a little over 100 papers out that kind of reference uh, these instruments. Uh, back then, we, we didn't uh, do a very sophisticated intercalibration of the, of the wavelength scale. Uh, what we used is you could look at the, the, uh, the oxygen line, which is a nice sharp line in the, in the solar spectrum. And if you ratio the radiance of the two instruments, and those are out of uh, calibration, what you would see is a little like a sync function because those were offset from one another. And so you would manually, there was a, a way in there where you could put a manual offset into one of the spectrometers to get that, to kind of minimize or null out that feature. And that's, that's how you did the wavelength calibration. Um, but unfortunately, by 2006, when we came out with the Field Spec 3 series, the kind of interest level in the field spec duel had dipped down and we were building maybe one a year and it was decided that we wouldn't carry that forward. So since 2006, ASD hasn't had a, a, a dual spectrometer instrument. Uh, yet there's been a lot, of, a lot of interest in it because certainly the, the land-based community really wanted a dual capability at, at, over the full wavelength range. Um, there was a paper that came out in, in 2012 that the author, the author that uh, uh, developed a kind of workflow for collecting uh, matched spectra on, on two systems, one fixed looking at a white reference and the second one that could move around, uh, and did a lot of modeling of, of the t kind of errors you get when you don't properly intercalibrate the, the uh, the X and Y scale. And at the bottom are some graphs showing the. Uh, uh, if you have a, a feature, these are model spectra, but if you have a feature like this and everything lying upright in the wavelength scale, they ratio out very nicely. But if they if they're offset relative to one another, uh, you you get uh, a feature that looks something like this. And this is in fact what we use to manually make the adjustment uh, back in the back in the early days. Um, and that's, you know, if you, if you go back and look at the, the earlier versions that, 
that have been done. You know, the, this early solution it was it was meter only, didn't go out beyond a thousand nanometers, and uh, a lot of that was, you know, partially that was based on cost. I mean, the, to to actually build an instrument that had two full range spectrometers in it starts to get really expensive. Uh, it was you know focused on water measurements, and it only had this this manual uh, method of, of wavelength intercalibration, um, and then you know there have been a number of groups that have done. Uh, manual systems for doing the dual spectrometer. Uh, it, when you're manually collecting the data like that, they're not perfectly time synchronized. You get the time difference down to about a second. Uh, it does allow you to fix one unit while the other one moves around. But it does, you know, you really, you don't see the reflectance spectra until after the fact. So you don't, don't have feedback in the field. Uh, and because you know, there's no easy way really to intercalibrate the two two spectrometers. So this is software we we finished up just very recently uh, that automates this whole process, and it covers the the full wavelength range. Um, and one of the thing one of the, besides the the uh, you know seeing the paper come out that shows that this this would work. We also realized that there's, you know, there's a large install base of, of our instruments out there. And if we could do a software solution, uh, people wouldn't have to buy a new instrument to do this. They would just need to get two instruments together. And, and as long as they had similar uh, wavelength uh, spectral resolution profiles, they, you could use them together. Um, so the software does this uh, intercalibration of both the wavelength scale and, and also the radiance scale. Uh, and, and because they're, they're linked together, you can, you can get down to a synchronization that's, that's about equivalent to a, a single scan, which is around 100 milliseconds. Uh, they're using wireless communication. So one of the, one of the spectrometers is, is hooked to the laptop using uh, hardwired ethernet, and then the other one is connected with, with Wi-Fi. And then, that also means you can you can display because the, the software is talking to both. Uh, you can you can compute and display a reflectance factor. This is kind of what the system looks like out of the field with one of the units uh, uh, kind of attached to a tripod and, and it's set up so that it's continually viewing this uh, this spectral and white reference panel. So besides intercalibrating the the x and y scale, the other uh, issue that, that you have to deal with is that the resolution of the instruments has to be equivalent because if you if you have two instruments that have significantly different spectral resolution uh, when you ratio the spectra you get artifacts here if, if these were uh, the same resolution you just get you just get a line of one and here you can see this is this is a an example of, of uh, a section of spectrum of mylar, just from 2100 to 2200 nanometers, so fairly small region. Uh, these are fairly sharp features. You can see two things that happen as, as you change the resolution. Uh, the, obviously, the, the depth of the feature uh, gets, gets shallower as you reduce the resolution, but also the position of the feature shifts. Anytime you have a, a uh, asymmetric absorption feature, the the wavelength of the absorption or the reflectance minimum here is dependent on spectral resolution. Uh, and the more asymmetric it is, uh, the, the larger the shift. This is part of the difficulty of you know what you what people use for uh, wavelength calibration because if you use a reflective material like a, a rare earths or things like that. Uh, the wavelength of those features is dependent on resolution, so it's it's not a it's not a single value. So one of the things that ASD wrestled with about, I guess it was about uh, eight years ago now, was that the uh, you have if you want to do a lot of a lot of things with a with a spectrometer like a quantitative analysis and such, and you want to be able to take a calibration that's done on one spectrometer and move it to another one, they really need to be relatively matched to one another. Uh, the, the resolution as a function of wavelength needs to be very similar from one unit to the next. 
And really prior to, to 2007, uh, you know, we had specifications for instruments. So let's say a, a field spec standard resolution had a, had a uh, specification for, for 10 nanometer resolution. And, uh, you know, and that, but when you were building the instrument, you would, you know, the, the instrument would get focused, the, the grading, you know, would do all the alignment, the focusing of the optical elements. And if we got higher than 10 nanometers, that was okay. You know, it was always sort of a one-sided specification. It had to be 10 nanometers or better in order to pass the spec. The problem with that is you ended up making instruments that, that the resolution profile, while it met the spec, it was it could be better than the spec because from sort of the remote sensing, the more spectral resolution is better. But if you're trying to use instruments, uh, multiple instruments for the same application, what you really don't want is every one as good as it can be. You want everything to be the same. So we we put in place a program to uh, have have specifications both on the high and low side and and also a specification at, at many different wavelengths so that the the profile of the spectral resolution uh, was was very constant uh, from machine to machine and we also changed the way that we use changed the ways we did wavelength calibration uh, prior to 2007 we used a uh, uh, a monochromator that was calibrated to a laser line uh, but the problem again with the monochromator is that in order to get enough light through the monochromator, you have to be allowing a, a fairly significant width, uh, peak width through, and and there's some uncertainty. Yeah, there's there's more uncertainty in the wavelength of your of your calibration source. So we developed a uh, uh, basically a box that had a number of atomic emission line sources in it. That were, and we designed our own lamps to get enough intensity because, kind of, the standard sort of 10 ray lamp that you can get from, say, an optics catalog, uh, particularly at the longer wavelengths, it didn't put out enough energy to uh, to get a to get a good signal to noise in the lines. Uh, so this allowed us to 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 do our calibrations uh, using emission lines, which are, uh, you know. From the standpoint of our spectrometers, are you know, infinitely narrow lines because they're they're, they're they're well under uh, any kind of resolution that we're you know, we're in more in the five to ten nanometer range. Uh, so it, it really improved the the accuracy of the of the uh, the wavelength scale calibration. And then we built a lot of, of uh, jigs and fixtures that we use so we could watch those lines and tune the spectrometer to match the resolution profile that we're targeting. Uh, and all this means that it ends up that if you get two field spec standard resolution images together, they're going to match each other quite closely. Here's another example of, of why you want to align uh, the spectral resolution scale very closely. Here's the solar spectrum with all its sharp features in it. If you just offset a little bit in ratio, you get you get all these these spikes, which would be uh, you know. So if you had two spectrometers you were using together, you really need quite precise uh, wavelength scale intercalibration in order to get to get a, a reasonable result. So what we uh, ended up with for this system was it's we we still use the atomic emission lines to calibrate the individual spectrometers. But in the field, right before you make your field measurements, you view this, uh, it's a reference tile that has a glaze that has a, a mix of a couple different rare earth oxides in it. And then it also has uh, a piece of mylar at the top. We need the mylar because the mylar gives us a few sharp features out here where the, where the rare earths are, have, uh, don't have very many features. Now, we're not relying on this in any way for any kind of absolute calibration really just a relative so we view it with both instruments one of the instruments gets designated as the master and then we do a, 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 a fit of one set of peaks on the on the uh, one instrument to the other one and then we just do a, a slope and offset correction to the wavelength calibration of, of that instrument to line the two up so here's an example, the red dots are what it looked like of the wavelength calibration mismatch between the two spectrometers looked like before we applied the slope and offset correction. And then the green, and this is an average, this is, I think, 
think about 60 different intercalibrations. Um, so the the, uh, the red is the, the the average difference between the the mobile unit and the uh, the, uh, the fixed what we call the fixed base unit, and then the green is is the the amount of difference in wavelength calibration. Yeah, at, again at these wavelengths after we did the, the slope and offset. Um, we decided to use a slope and offset because we we uh, uh, back in. 2007 did an interesting experiment where we had a we just put a, a, a spectrometer in the back of one of the employees' cars and drove it down these four-wheel drive dirt roads and the whole idea was to to uh, let it bounce around a bit and see how the way you know what what the characteristics of the uh, drift in wavelength calibration were on a typical instrument and we found that a, that a, uh, a slope and offset was enough to to kind of correct for around 95% of the, uh, the, the shift that we saw. So here's an example of, of how the whole system works. We used uh, these two field spec four instruments. The, the software also works with uh, the older field spec threes. When we did this, you know, so the field spec three line started before 2007 when we put in place a lot of these uh, new manufacturing techniques. So early uh, field spec threes uh, probably should get kind of brought up to the, the current rev before, you know, just to make sure you get the, the best performance out of them. But anyway, this test we used two field spec three fours. Uh, we used uh, uh, this one here for the the, the uh, fixed base unit, but it's the, the one that stays still and monitors the white reference. And then uh, this other one here for the, the mobile unit, the one that moves around. And this is this is uh, I went back and, and looked at the the irradiance or the, just the radiance coming off the white reference panel, and and looked at how the light conditions were changing uh, during the <coughs> the about thirty minutes that we were making measurements, a little less, closer to twenty five minutes, I guess. And for, for water vapor, what I did is I just took a ratio of, of uh, the, or to get the depth of the water band feature, one of the ones near, uh, I think near about 1,200 or so. And you can see the amount of water vapor was, was changing uh, quite dramatically. And the brightness, uh, overall brightness, was just integrated over the whole spectrum. And uh, the brightness didn't change as much as the water vapor did. So when you're out in the field, that we, we built this fixture that allows you to mount the the, uh, the pistol grips holding the fiber optics of both instruments, so that both instruments are viewing roughly the same patch of, of real estate on on the white reference panel, and the mount's designed so that these these holders slide in. So depending on whether you've got a uh, the round spectral on or the the five by five or the ten by ten, they all kind of fit on here. And uh, so you start out by both viewing the the, uh, the white reference. Uh, you collect the white reference. Then they both view the uh, this is the wavelength standard uh, or reference tile. And again, this is only used for intercalibration. It's not used in any absolute sense. Uh, th this is sort of the setup you would do if you had a, a, a reasonably good day with you know not perfect day, but uh, because here you are using you're making the assumption the light hasn't changed that much between collecting the white reference and collecting the, the wavelength reference. And uh, we, we tried this on a number of days where, uh, uh, you know, e even if the light is changing enough, it doesn't change the wavelengths of these positions so that you, you know, this, this works relatively well. Uh, if, if you want to be more careful about it, you can use, uh, a, mo a lot of the systems have this, it's called a contact probe that has a light source built in. And uh, if you don't want to worry about light conditions for the, for the uh, wavelength scale intercalibration, uh, you, you do get a little better results by using this the contact probe to make the, again, you have to, you'd have to move the fiber optic of the, the two instruments back and forth. So you make the, the wavelength measurement using that accessory. Uh, but then, you know, once it's done this, the software takes the two scans calculates peak positions, does the, the regression to find the correction, applies the correction, and then gives you some statistics back as to 
how good a job it did matching the, the two instruments. Uh, once you've done that, you go back to uh, doing the radiance intercalibration, where again, both instruments are viewing the same white reference panel. And the thing is, if you assume that the radiance calibration of the instruments was perfect, you could just go and collect radiance spectra, ratio them to get to get reflectance. The reality is that there, you know, there isn't, you know, they aren't perfect. So by collecting this, by having both instruments view a white reference panel simultaneously, you get a ratio of of what each instrument thinks the radiance is, and you can use that as a, then a correction factor to correct subsequent uh, measurements. So this is, we call this the, the time zero radiance ratio. Um, and what we found is that, that you know, you do this when you start up at the beginning of the day, but probably once every 20 minutes or half an hour, it's not a bad idea to go back and do this every once in a while if you want everything to be as tight as possible. So once you've done those things, then at that point, you can move around in the field and collect spectra. And this instrument, the laptop controlling this instrument, is, is continually polling this one to get, uh, to get uh, the downwelling radiance, or the, the reflected radiance measurement that, that the uh, fixed unit. And then it's just doing the computation that, that it, it takes the instantaneous ratio between the radiance measured from the mobile unit divided by the the fixed unit, and then it corrects it using this factor that it measured at time zero. And again, uh, this all takes care of any time varying radius, but depending on conditions, uh, the distance between this person and, and this tripod uh, can also um, be an issue. So you just have to be aware of that. So here's some examples of uh, spectra that were collected. This has been blanked out in, the, in the, the deep water features. But you can see that these were collected on a day when, you know, it was pretty crummy. There was a lot of, lot of cirrus clouds uh, drifting in front of the sun. And what, what we found is that, you know, if you've got thick clouds, you know, while you can make measurements when the sun is behind those clouds, the energy level is so low, you, 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 know, you do get noise creeping into the spectrum because of the low, low levels of irradiance. Uh, but as long as you've got space, you know, if you, as long as you kind of limit your collection to the time when the, the uh, clouds are kind of away from, from the sun, uh, this does do a very good job of taking care of all the time varying water vapor that you, that you typically encounter in the field. So just in, in summary, uh, the software, it, it provides the means to accurately intercalibrate both the reflectance scale and uh, the radiance scale of the two spectrometers, uh, synchronizes the collection on the two to within uh, you know, a tenth of a second or so, and uh, it, it really enables collection of field spectra under conditions that uh, normally, you wouldn't you wouldn't try to make measurements, um, and separating the, the collection of the, the white reference and sample scans uh, does enable some some interesting things. Uh, you know, certainly for, for uh, goniometers, where if you want to make turn those into reflectance, having one instrument just sitting there measuring a, a, a white panel while the other one is is transiting and measuring different angles is useful. Uh, We've had a couple people that have been interested in, in drones, the idea that like in a, in a field trial for crops where you have 50 or so sites in a field, uh, being able to set up your, your unit measuring the white reference panel uh, adjacent to the row and then just using uh, a drone to, to hover over each of the field sites and rapidly collect uh, the, uh, the upwelling radius values uh, is, is an interesting application that we may be trying to, to uh, Test out this summer, and then and then uh, a lot of people using tractor-mounted systems that have a, an instrument or boom looking down at the tractor again, having a separate uh, instrument measuring uh, white reference is, is useful. So for uh, again, I mentioned compatible systems. Uh, the Spec three, the, that project we called the Summit project. This was back in 2007 when we changed a lot of manufacturing approaches. Uh, so any instrument, either these serial numbers or this one and above, uh, are, are, would be 
you know, are compatible with the software that all the field spec cores. Uh, the key is you want them uh, accurately calibrated and they need to be of the same resolution. So we have a lot of different flavors. You wouldn't want to mix, say, a, a standard res instrument and a high res instrument. They ought to be the same. And, and we have had, we have done trials where we mixed field spec fours and field spec five, uh, or field spec threes, and, and that works fine as well. So that's, that's it. So, any questions? Seconds. <laughs> <laughs> ah. All right. Uh, thanks, Brian. Yeah. Back to this one. Oh. All right. And now, please allow me to introduce Dr. Charles Chip Bachman. Dr. Bachman received his uh, Bachelor's of Arts in Physics from Princeton University in June 1984, and his Master's in Science and PhD degrees in Physics from Brown University in 1986 and 1990. For 23 years, he was a research physicist with the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. During his last 10 years at NRL, he was the head of the Coastal Science and Interpretation Section in the Coastal and Ocean Remote Sensing Branch within NRL's Remote Sensing Division. In 2013, he accepted a faculty position here at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where he's currently the Frederick and Anna B. White Weedman Chair and Associate Professor in the Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science. Uh, we appreciate Dr. Bachman's uh, being an ASD champion and along with his staff helping in a large part to plan and co-host today's event. Dr. Bachman will be presenting on the hyperspectral BRDF measurements and modeling of sediment properties using the goniometer of the Rochester Institute of Technology, and immediately following Dr. Bachman will be Justin Harms. Uh, Justin is currently completing his doctorate in imaging science at the Rochester Institute of Technology. He graduated from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville in 2009 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, and earned his Master's in Electrical Engineering from the University of New Mexico in 2012. Justin's most recent employment was at the Directed Energy Directorate of the Air Force Research Laboratory at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico, where he was uh, worked as a laser vulnerability engineer in the laser effects research branch and as a program manager for the semiconductor laser program. Currently, he is, his research is focused on collecting accurate institute spectral reflectance of targets using portable goniometers in the field environments. And he will also be presenting on the uh, next generation of hyperspectral goniometer system Goniometer of the Rochester Institute of Technology, two. Chip. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Okay. 
Okay, hopefully that's a little better. I'll try to speak a little louder. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work, therefore, that we're doing trying to understand the directional dependence of the reflectance spectrum. Um, speak a bit about some of the past experiments uh, that we've done in this regard, especially over the Bill Philpott, hearing from later. Uh, talk a bit about some of the work we're trying to do to relate these kinds of measurements to rated transfer models and how they're constrained uh, to simplify some of these models, especially with the idea of being able to pull out uh, geophysical properties uh, from landscapes beyond just the composition. So with that in mind, here's a picture of uh, a set of kind of from three different perspectives. This is on the shores of Lake Ontario, and you can see the grid up there uh, over one of the sites, and the sample comes essentially from that location. However, you don't really appreciate the rich richness of it until you start to look at a microscope picture of this. As you can see, uh, there's a lot of uh, variability in the kinds of materials present, the degree of optical contrast. And so it's quite surprising that you can actually see some very interesting properties and some complexity that you wouldn't expect just by looking at an ordinary sediment, uh, such as on a beach. So a lot of the things that influence the spectral response are composition, grain size distribution, uh, density, the moisture content, the surface and the core water. And uh, Bill's talk later will be uh, focused especially on the moisture content. We understand the directional dependence because we'd like to be able to retrieve some of these additional properties of the sediment to be able to get the density or the grain size distribution or some information about that from the landscape from the directional spectrum. So uh, here are some examples of spectra we collect in the field of the system. Obviously the wavelength dependence of it tells you something about the composition. That's what ASD has uh, always been uh, geared towards in terms of their designs with their instruments. But we're actually starting to look at something somewhat different. We're looking at the angular dependence, so we're actually going to look at the structure of the response as the uh, sensor is buried in terms of its view geometry and as the uh, sun moves around in the sky throughout the day. So here's an example of a set of measurements that were taken with an ASD spectrometer. Um, they were collected over the hemisphere by grid. And what you're seeing is a plot of these in angular space, uh, where the angle in beta and V is uh, shown here. And uh, we're looking at a specific wavelength, which is highlighted there by the dash line. So as you can see, a lot of structure here potentially, and uh, you can see forward scattered lobes and backward scattered lobes. And these will change as we vary things like density or grain size distributions. And that provides actually information through a rate transfer model to tell us something about what is underneath here, what, is, what kind of density we might have or what grain size distribution. Um, a bit of a word about definitions. So if you look in the literature, there's a lot of discussion about what is BRDF. BRDF is actually a catch all term, of course. Um, it's a very idealized quantity. It's a, a ratio essentially between scattered radiants and incoming irradiants, but it is an infinitesimal quantity, and therefore uh, what we're measuring with a practical system is something that involves a conical measurement or a hemispherical measurement for looking um, outdoors because we have to use skylight and uh, direct solar. So we talk about this as being essentially a hemispherical conical uh, reflectance factor measurement. Um, I bring up these terms because if you read the literature, you will find that they're described in different ways. They're really talking about the same thing. It's just that we're emphasizing in these cases the fact that we're trying to approximate what is a really an idealized quantity. With that in mind, if I use one term or the other, I'm really talking about the same thing. It's just we're approximating. Okay, so let's talk a bit about this instrument and uh, what it does and how it actually accomplishes the measurements that you were seeing in that example. Um, Brit, actually has two onboard stepper motors um, that drive the system in azimuth. So one actually rotates one ring on top of another to move the system in azimuth. The second motor brings the uh, sensor head along the zenith arc. And so we can position the system pretty much between zero and 65 degrees in zenith and, and anywhere we want in azimuth. This is a wide range of ability to uh, measure. It's a fairly field portable system, as you can see. I, in the past, I was involved with much larger systems. This one can be carried by two or three people. Um, as you'll see with Justin's presentation in a short while, we've actually gone quite a bit, uh, put this instrument on a diet, if you will. And so uh, we're down to about 165 pounds with the next generation instrument, even with the two ASDs on, on board. Uh, one thing we did add to this instrument to make it, uh, I should say, more precise is to incorporate the idea of putting IMUs on board so that we can actually look and understand where we're actually uh, 
um, in Zenith and in Azimuth. Um, one of the things that you can look at a lot of the systems that have been designed in the past, they typically report in Azimuth or Zenith, but their actual knowledge of pointing may be quite suspect, maybe a couple degrees off in many cases. So our, our effort here was to try to, to refine that accuracy so that we could reliably report on the RDF. Uh, as was mentioned in, in the previous talk by Brian, uh, we go through a process of, of calibration. So we have a large uh, spectral on panel that is placed uh, in the scene prior to measurement so they can calculate reflectance factors. This is actually a, an interesting shot when the NASA G light was passing around right overhead exactly at that moment. Um, we had a second going on during the field of this experiment. The LGS2 was present. Um, this process, as was mentioned in the previous talk, is done and a sediment uh, radius sample is collected. And in order to avoid the problems discussed earlier, we actually um, do a, a dual spectrometer measurement process where we uh, try to use one spectrometer to uh, minimize the variability that we see in the skylight. That was uh, the 2012 paper that Brian mentioned. Um, as noted, if you don't do this cross calibration process, you're going to have uh, spectral artifacts that appear because of the wavelength and this registration. Um, it is one of the things that allows us to measure really under um, subpar uh, sky conditions. We've used it for many years, including with the sconeometer system and ones that I've worked on before I came here to RIT. Uh, actually, GRID is part of a, a larger global capability that we've developed here within um, the center. Uh, we can actually field this instrument. In fact, it was driven across the country in this band here, which is actually also a mobile laboratory. So a lot of the work that we do not only involves optical instrumentation, but also geotechnical instrumentation. And we can bring them all to one location, uh, decamp all the equipment, and then set up a mobile lab right there with power and Wi-Fi as if we were actually back here at RIT. It's a tremendous advantage because it allows us to process uh, samples right in the field. And we use that now um, in this NASA campaign. Here are a couple of examples of the kinds of measurements we take in the field from a geotechnical perspective. We're trying to link these measurements directly to uh, the observed and directional reflectance measurements. So this is an example of uh, trying to estimate the local density of the sediment. Um, it's called a sand cone field density measurement. And what essentially you do here is to uh, remove a uh, part of the sediment in the location and replace it with a known calibrated sand. You measure the weight of the bond, and you can actually estimate what the density of the removed uh, so sediment was in that location. We also, also calculate grain size distributions, moisture content, and a number of other variables that we feel are, are critical factors that influence the reflectance beyond just the material uh, composition. Uh, in the laboratory settings, the instrument is the reason we built it in, in this scale and size was so that we could actually uh, operate the same instrument both in the field and laboratory settings. And so grid when it's on an optical table looks like this. You have a rotating light source that uh, rotates over the top and we prepare samples um, and operate much as, if, as we would in a field setting, except we don't have a fuse light, of course. Uh, we control the variables uh, individually, uh, such as grain size distribution uh, and density and moisture content. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit in this presentation about the idea of of density and how it influences uh, the spectral response in a directional sense. Um, what we have done here is develop uh, a device that allows us to mimic alien deposition. And so we can rain down the sediment at different rates, and the degree of packing is very much controlled by that rate of alluviation, um, uh, is the, the proper term in the geotechnical sense that's usually used. In any case, uh, we have control and uh, it allows us to understand some of the data that we actually see in the field context where we have very little control over the samples. Now, uh, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit to some work that Bill Philpott and I did um, a few years ago. Uh, we were trying to understand the uh, scattering properties of sediments, and at that time uh, we had a very large field goniometer, but it, we could not bring it indoors, and so. Uh, lacking a grit instrument, we actually used a very simple um, principal plane goniometer system that we developed uh, just putting two rotational stages together with an ASD. And uh, we were very surprised by the results that we saw because we expected from rate of transfer theory to see that as we densify the material, we'd see more uh, backscatter, more reflectance. And in fact, we saw exactly the opposite. We repeated the experiment a number of times trying to understand uh, what was actually going on 
and uh, realized that it was a real effect. And we started to look at microscope pictures and realized, hey, maybe it actually has something to do with the composition. And in fact, what we believed at the time was that uh, we had two different materials with optical contrast, and as we densified them, maybe the multiple scattering was being shut down, and that was what was causing the opposite. We actually saw it um, with greater density, um, less reflectance. So it was quite surprising to us. So we began to look not just at the laboratory data, but also at some of our field data. Uh, this is what we saw in the laboratory. It's actually quite a strong effect, and it increases with phase angle, the strongest in the short infrared, as you see in some of these examples here. Um, but we actually had the virtue of having had experiments in a lot of different coastal types, and so we could look at sediments with different properties, some that had a high degree of optical contrast and others that were um, more uniform in quality, and others that were somewhere in between, such as these olivine sands in the middle that you see here, which had dark inclusions. And the effect was strongest, obviously, when you have the um, uh, high degree of optical contrast between materials like quartz and magnetite, uh, which you see here on the left. Um, but when we had something like the inclusions or the low contrast materials, the effect either disappeared or was reversed. And we began to think, okay, the material uh, actually plays an important part of this, the intimate mixture that's there, um, and the ability to uh, densify is now showing us that we're going to see something that contradicts what our naive assumptions were originally. We actually looked in field data and saw the same kinds of things. Uh, we took our very large goniometer system at that time uh, to the field and reproduced exactly the same kinds of measurements that we'd seen uh, in the laboratory setting. Um, these are sites where uh, essentially we had the same moisture content. The only real difference between them was the density, and in this case, the more, more dense sand was actually less reflective, just as we'd seen in the laboratory. It did not seem to depend on whether we had moisture content present in large or small amounts. The same effect was present, and so we began to believe that this was a real phenomenon. Well, we had also done airborne studies at the same time, and when we looked at the overpasses at different times, which changed the phase angle of these locations, we saw the same thing. Um, and indeed, it increased as the phase angle got larger, just as we had seen in the laboratory studies. So it was a real effect. We could see it from remote sensing, we could see it in the field with our portable goniometer system, and we could see it in the controlled conditions of the laboratory. Well, we knew the uh, composition played an important role, but we didn't really know if that was the only uh, factor at work here. Um, more recent experiments that we've done, we've gone back to try to understand this in much greater detail. So here's an example of a sediment from the shore of Lake Ontario that I showed you earlier. Like the uh, sediment that we had looked at originally with uh, Bill Philpott, it does have a, a high degree of optical contrast between constituents, so that's very much the same. Um, and so we figured this was the kind of sediment that we could use to sort of go back and re-explore some of the issues that might be at work here. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned, of course, is that we have control over density, and with this deposition device that I described, we could control and measure and prepare samples in a very careful way, um, leaving all other variables constant. And uh, what you'll see in a, a moment or two are some examples of these kinds of measurements. Um, and what we've done, in addition to varying the density, is also look at what happens as we change the illumination. And so what you'll see is a kind of a prelude to that is the fact that uh, the degree of multiple scatter changes. And that is a very important factor in whether this mechanism that Bill and I described in the paper um, is actually a play. Let's, let's walk into this for a moment and see. So this is the apparatus. Um, just to orient you to the experiments that I'm going to show you, um, the light source in our experiments, I'm just going to show two cases, one where the light source is very close to Nader, and the other, uh, the second blue star, where it's very far um, away from Nader. And we're going to look at four different prepared densities. So here are examples of the spectral reflectance for those four cases all across the hemisphere, just arranged as a group. I've shown one example here just to kind of orient you what it looks like in VRDF in terms of its angular dependence. All right. So here's the, the first example. And I just want to highlight some of the qualitative factors that you'll see with an example like this. Um, so we're looking from the lowest density here on the upper left, uh, increasing density to the right. And then as we drop down to the, the next row, you know, ever increasing density. Um, and so what you notice right away is that um, the first case, the lowest density that we could prepare with the current deviation device, you have both forward and backward scattering. There's also quite a bit of 
off-plane scattering, uh, which is really a multiple scattering effect. As we increase the density, um, we now have more well-defined lobes initially. Um, then the lobes get much larger, and eventually it's actually much more forward scattering than it is backward scattering. So overall, we kind of started from something that was somewhat defined in terms of lobes to something that's more forward scattering than, than anything else. This is a short wave infrared wavelength. Let's look at another example. This is much more um, <coughs> stark in contrast in terms of the cases. This is uh, in the green, and so now we start with something that's more backward scattering. And as we progress through these different sequences, we eventually um, produce a forward look. So things have shifted more in the forward direction as it goes through density. Level. Now, what happens when we raise the light source from a oblique up to a more nadir position? Uh, it's much more diffuse. Um, more multiple scattering is present. You can see that this uh, same sort of trend towards more backward scattering is still present, but it's quite diffuse. And as we progress through these, we have um, scattering moving towards the forward direction, and it's much more well defined. Okay, they're different, but it's quite clear that when this, the light source is closer to nadir, that it's much more diffuse in general, so we have more multiple scattering. Now, when we looked at the same kinds of plots as we saw earlier, where we plot for a single wavelength um, versus phase, phase angle um, and look at the different densities. In the case where the light source is more bleak and more well-defined and less multiple scattering, uh, we see what Happy predicted in some of his radio transfer models, which is that um, it actually increases as we densify. When the light source is closer to nadir and we have more diffuse scattering, more multiple scattering, it's the opposite. <coughs> and as a result, what we can actually see is that the illumination conditions also play an important role. And the measurements that Bill and I had taken before with those three different sands that you saw were actually more like the ones on the right. They were taken at 20 degrees um, from the scene of the behavior pattern. So we can either have what I'll call happy-like behavior or non-happy-like behavior. And it really depends on whether we have a lot of multiple scattering present. And it also depends on whether we have materials that have optical contrast. So all these factors play a role. Okay, so that's kind of a qualitative description of what's happening. We're also comparing these directly to radio transfer models. So a lot going on in radio transfer models, and I don't have time in a lecture like this to go through the details of it, but it's important to understand that these have contributions for single scattering, for multiple scattering, and then for also the opposition effect, which is the surge in the retroreflectance direction. Um, all of these terms have dependence on porosity, field factor, are all in there in a nonlinear way. And one of the biggest problems in comparing models like this to the kinds of measurements you've just seen is that there are a lot of free parameters. And so what do you do? Normally people would do some kind of nonlinear optimization. We've actually been looking at a different way of simplifying this so that we can understand whether this is an accurate description of the settings. You can always end up at a local minimum when doing optimization, and you don't really want to conclude from that that you've made a good match to your model. So what we do um, in the laboratory to try to get around this is to uh, essentially constrain the measurement to reduce some of these parameters. One of the ways we've done this is to take our grid system and fix the phase angle. So that's the angle between the light source and the sensor. As we rotate the, the two together, we lock that phase, and what happens is that the single scattering term becomes a constant. We can get rid of a lot of uh, things that we need to worry about at that point and just focus in on two variables. One is the fill factor, and the other is the single scattering of the So that's the important thing to take away from the slide. You can forget about the math for now. You can read the paper if you'd like to know more about it. But uh, this is really the essence of what we're doing. It allows us to directly compare multiple scattering in models like those of Happy to the observed PRDF that's coming out of the grid instrument. And what we see is that as we start to try to optimize those two free variables, the fill factor and the single scattering libido, um, it works in some of the cases quite well, but it isn't consistent across wavelengths. So you can see a great fit over here at 855 nanometers and 2153 nanometers, but over 420, not so much. And so that tells us that this multiple scattering approximation isn't really faithfully characterizing the actual observed scatter over all wavelengths. So we began to consider what can we do? Um, the issue here is that uh, in Happy's model, is quite typical. Um, multiple scatter is assumed to be isotropic. Um, 
That isn't actually true, but it's a great way to come up with an analytical solution. So what we've done is to reinstall, if you will, some kind of directional dependence, and the result of our mathematical manipulations, which I won't go into great detail about, is that we're treating multiple scatter in such a way that it's isotropic up to the very last scattering point. And in that last scattering event, we're installing, we're reinstalling the single part of the phase function, so there's directionality in that last scattering event as it leaves the sediment. If we do that, um, we actually are making progress now, and we have a much better fit. How can we estimate this actual phase function? Well, we can use the original IMSA model um, in its form from the data, come up with the first principles estimate, and install it in our modified model. That's sort of the essence of it. Uh, when we do that, we get a much better result over all these wavelengths for realistic um, values of single scattering field and fill. So we find this very encouraging because uh, it means that we're actually we now have a multiple scattering term that makes sense that describes the data we're actually seeing in the laboratory. And it isn't an enormous change from the analytical solution. So we can understand it in a very uh, physical way. So this was a uh, fairly recent work that we did and published in August. Um, the other plus side of this is that going back to the qualitative slides that I started with where I talked about, you know, what do we see when we just plot out the BRDF? Well, when you modify the Model, models that we see in radio transfer to include this additional uh, factor in the multiple scattering, we can now reproduce what we call this bowl effect. So that's the off principle plane scattering that we saw. So if you look up here, if you run a Ford model with Happy's radio transfer model, you see there's some gaps here on, on the sides. Um, it's not possible to fill those gaps with that model that's isotropic for multiple scattering. When we uh, put in this uh, modified form, we actually can fill in those holes, and it looks much more like this um, distribution that we often see. So it's very promising because not only do we fit the data better, but we're actually reproducing um, in a qualitative sense, or at least in an angular sense, what we expect to see in terms of distribution. So this is where we are right now. Now, um, seen some interesting things. This instrument is great. Uh, made a lot of headway with it, but what Justin's now going to tell you about is, um, I think, a real quantum leap from this instrument. You notice a lot of problems with this instrument. It has potential for self-shading that is not so great because it has a big zenith arc that's quite thick. Um, it has a full ring, which means that if your sun is over here and it's low in the sky, you can actually cast a shadow right into the place you're trying to measure. There are a lot of issues. We've heard a great talk from Brian about the issue of trying to remove skylight variations from our data. So the new system is, is going to address that. And without the ceiling off thunder, I'm going to introduce him now and let him tell you about what we call grid two or grid T, uh, which is going to improve all these things. Okay. That's the one you take over. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so my name is Justin Harms. I'm going to talk to you today about the next generation hyperspectral field goniometer. Uh, it's called the goniometer uh, of the Rochester Institute of Technology version 2, or what I'll refer to as grid T. I'd also like to point out that it's not only been um, efforts on my part, um, there's been others uh, included in this effort um, in various aspects, but I wanted to point them out as well. And those are on the bottom of the slide for your reference. So what I'll talk about is, what is a goniometer? Um, to those not, you know, completely, um, I guess, fluent in remote sensing uh, terminology, it might not seem like a, a, an instrument that you've ever heard of. I'll go over that, I'll talk about what we currently have, um, basically kind of leave a, uh, start where a chip left off uh, with what we, uh, features we currently have in our, our grid goniometer. Then I'll talk about the next generation goniometer, which is the grid T. Um, and I'll talk about the improvements that, that we kind of uh, made with that device over the old one, and I'll talk about some of the new features that that device has over others that we've seen out um, in literature. And then uh, I'll go over the current status with you and show you some cool pictures. 
So what is a goniometer? Well, it's a term that we use to describe a device that measures reflected light at various angles with the goal of creating a reflectance function. So essentially what we're trying to do is measure the reflected light at every point over a hemisphere um, over the top of a certain target. So there's various ways of doing that. You see our current grid here doing it in pretty rough conditions. You see um, something similar to what Dr. Bachman had talked about before with doing it in lab laboratory conditions. Others like something like this, so you, you can move um, the illumination source and the sensor at the same time um, around the target itself. And ultimately you're trying to come up with something like this, as you saw in the last presentation. So there's various types of them. Um, many of them are created for specific scientific applications because if you're trying to measure um, you know, tall vegetation, you're not going to be able to use a small gun to do that. You're going to have to build something larger. Or if you're trying to measure snow very accurately, or if you need something that's extremely lightweight because you're going to go stop around the marsh. So some of them that have been built for the laboratory are very fancy, intricate designs, such as this one here. But it actually uses a six-axis robot to measure um, and manipulate a sensor over the top of a certain target. This one over here is a very popular system. That's the dual UFIGO system from the University of Zurich. And uh, it's very large and has been used for agricultural things. Um, you see it measuring snow there. There's others here that are only uh, measuring one plane at a time, so they don't actually measure the entire uh, hemisphere, but they'll just do a few slices in order to keep the system very, very lightweight. And then you see others over here, um, like the Mantis system, that are exceptionally lightweight and made to basically be broken down and put into a backpack. Our device uh, is made to measure sediments primarily, and we want to be able to hit every single point in the hemisphere, so we're trying to get something that will create a full-featured uh, BRDF, if you will with uh, azimuth rotations, maybe at 30 or 15 degrees. So this is what you saw from the previous um, presentation, and I just wanted to hit on a couple things um, as well. The IMUs and stuff like that that we have on here provide us with very good information about where we are in the world. That's important because not every goniometer has those kind of things on board. They often understand the, the angles that they report are oftentimes from what they've told the system to do. So in zenith or azimuth, they'll command their system to go to 15 degrees um, off of nadir or something like that, but they don't actually often measure what it really achieved. There's other things going on here like mechanical deflections and possible motor slippage that can ultimately um, you know, create errors in your data and make it very difficult to interp uh, interpret certain terminologies. So this is a great start in that we are already starting to do motor movements and then check those with IMUs um, and with differential GPS antennas. But we wanted to go one step further with the next system. So the future Grignard of RIT had a few things that it, it needed to do. Um, like I said, we started with improvements. And then from there, we actually you know, used that as a, as a springboard to go into even new features um, as time permitted. So ultimately, what we're trying to get is a purpose-driven design that balances weight and source of error, optical and mechanical accuracy to achieve a high-performance um, system in a very small package, something that we can take out in the middle of the desert that we can pull behind an ATV, you know, miles off of the nearest paved road. Uh, a lot of those things are very difficult for larger goniometer systems that are full-featured, and you might not be able to get a six-foot or eight-foot tall system three miles into the California desert, as we've done with ours. So we wanted, mobility was key. We wanted a system that was more mobile. So in order to do that, we needed to reduce weight. Um, Dr. Bachman had talked about how the original grip was a, a prototype that was put together in just a couple months, basically, uh, when he had first arrived here for a field experiment that they needed to conduct. That's great, but ultimately it means that a lot of the things were off-the-shelf components because they needed to do it very quickly. And so a lot of it was steel, things that they could just find um, you know, in your local hardware store or just quickly get online. With grid we were trying to make sure that we were using aluminum to provide excellent structural rigidity, uh, but removing the majority of the weight. And then we're using high-performance industrial parts. And that's key because when you start talking about mobility, the first thing that happens is you want to go off miles into the desert, right? And you have blowing sand, you have austere conditions, temperature is well over 100 degrees. Those are things that can be catastrophic for robotic systems. And when you're doing that, you don't want to have a lot of downtime. So you want to design your system around this mobility that you've now, um, you've now created. And along with that comes the need to adapt to various terrains. If you get out there, you might encounter dune systems, something that's not perfectly level. 
typically when gun armor systems measure targets, the targets are roughly level, uh, and you can measure the target very easily. With the next generation device, we require automatic leveling and the ability to accommodate various target heights. If we want to hug the side of a dune and measure the VRDF of that, because we're doing calibration for NASA, we need to be sure that the system is going to be leveled, stay planted, so that we have a, a common reference plane within the overhead sensors. And it'll also be able to accommodate the, the actual height of the target below the frame. So it's something that um, is fairly difficult to do, but necessary for us. We also wanted something that was more accurate, both mechanically and optically. So mechanically might not seem like that big of a deal, but again, if you put this in the context of very high temperatures, blowing sand, you know, sometimes torrential downpours that happen when you don't expect because you're on the coast somewhere, um, or wind, it can become a big issue. So what we did to understand our position all the time is have the motor movements like normal, but we also had sealed encoders that actually are monitoring the true um, you know, reached angle so you know where the device actually ended up, which is really important. So if you moved over to 45 degrees off Nader and the wind's blowing slightly and you actually only made it to 43, we know that with the system because we have encoders that are constantly monitoring it. In addition, optically, as the, the two presenters before me kind of explained, there's a need to compensate for varying illumination, both temporally and spatially. So one of the things we decided we had to do was compensate for this background illumination. And in order to do that, we had to gather uh, spatially resolved illumination data. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. Another improvement that was important over the, the previous design was something that was fully automated. We had a semi-automated device in grid. But what we were really looking for was something that would be beginner friendly and would be more of a set it and forget it type thing. You program your scan pattern in, the scan pattern is then executed automatically via computer controlled motions that are constantly monitoring for errors and other things and controlling the ASDs all in conjunction. In order to do that, you had to have a trustworthy design because we didn't want multiple operators to have to sit there and monitor it and ensure that it's reaching where it's supposed to be going. So we put reliable motions, uh, or we, we required reliable motions in austere environments, as you see here. Um, that's water from you know, basically a small pond that we're sitting at the very edge of. So that mud and stuff can, can really put a damper on your remote sensing day uh, if, your, if your motor's getting come up. In order to uh, achieve these reliable motions, we went with components, industrial components that are created for you know, uh, high ops tempo, uh, manufacturing environments, and that's something Grit T has been, has been using. We also, as I mentioned, have error reporting for each instrument on there. So including the ASDs, we accept all the errors that it can possibly provide, and then we have error reporting from all of our other instruments um, that are monitoring mechanical motions to make sure that we are fully aware of everything that's going on. If it didn't reach its, its commanded motion, we know where it actually ended up, and we know how to handle that afterwards. So the next thing uh, are the new features. So this is a big one, um, that's why it's first. Target tracking is really important, and it might seem a little obvious at first, but a lot of young owners have a very difficult time with this because they're typically made out of circles, right? So we have circular um, frames that basically have a set target plane. So right here you notice that the target plane of this uh, notional device is set, and it's exactly um, at the bottom of the frame. It can't be moved. What that means is if you have unlevel terrain or something, where your target's actually down here, you actually end up staring through your target plane and looking at other portions of the ground. You're not actually tracking a single place anymore. That raises some serious concerns uh, about spatial uniformity of your test site. If you're on a beach or something where the tide is coming in and there's only narrow bands of a certain type of sediment you're trying to measure, that can become a big issue. And you'll go end up creating a VRDF that's actually, actually a conglomerate of other sediments that are around it. Uh, and essentially it's some you know, synthetic reflectance function that actually doesn't represent anything. So with this device, uh, we track a single spot on the ground and at all times we'll always be sure to be looking at that particular spot, no matter the, the height of the target. That's something we measure with lasers. Um, do we get designed? So it's very, it's very perfect timing um, for Dr. Curtis to come here and talk about this uh, dual spectrometer approach because this is something we're interested in as well. So Dr. Bachman talked to you about how he uses the dual spectrometer approach to monitor temporal changes in illumination. It's 
really important because as, you say, as you've seen, cirrus clouds and moisture content and other things can really create sharp spikes in your spectra and essentially erroneous um, reflectance. However, there's another aspect of it that you must also pay attention to when you're doing uh, BRDF measurements either near tall trees or near structures, and that's the spatial aspect of the illumination. So not only do you need to monitor the temporal illumination, you need to monitor the spatial illumination around it. So what we've done is we've essentially used two uh, ASD uh, field spec four uh, spectrometers to monitor this. And one of them stares down at the target as you see here. The other one is staring exactly opposite back up at the sky. And over the course of the scan, we'll build up an illumination profile that is spatially resolved in addition to the spectrometer that Dr. Bachman typically runs, which is monitoring temporal changes. So now you have that temporal and that spatial information that you need to get back to actually gathering true BRDF, or a very close approximation to BRDF. I say a close approximation because yoni hours typically measure uh, HCRF, which is hemispherical illumination and a conical reflection back to some finite elements uh, detector size. That's, it's important to, to notice the distinction there because when you get down to actually using that reflectance function that you've created to do other things, um, you have to realize that that spatial illumination is inherent in your data. So if you don't have the exact same sky conditions that you had, or illumination conditions that you have when that BRDF was taken, you're getting errors um, that are you know, being passed through your reflect reflectance function, you might not realize it. Because you can't remove that, that uh, diffuse information and it has to be represented exactly in order to be right. So we are able to actually remove that by capturing the spatial information, and we don't have to rely on atmospheric modeling to do that, which can introduce a, another uh, error in there. This is a similar approach to what's been done with dual view phygos from the University of Missouri. And it uses, I won't go into the details of math too much, but it uses a technique that was described by Martin Chick in 1994, and Again, it's similar to what's been used on dual-view phygos. It's based on splitting the reflected radiance into a diffuse component and a direct component, and you operate them, operate on them separately, um, and you iterate through this, and then you ultimately will um, create a reflectance function that uh, aligns with uh, the reflected radiance that you saw from your spectrometer, and you end up with BRF, which can be converted to BRDF just through a, uh, a scalar. So another important feature of this is the elevation model. We capture a digital elevation model of the target area. And it's great because it also allows us to do the target tracking. But more importantly, from that information, if we are on an incline or if our target is rotated in some way, it allows us to back that geometry back into the data. If you think about it, when you're putting a goniometer over the top of a, a target, the goniometer is level. If the target is unlevel, you're actually not looking at that 45 degree look that you thought you were. You're looking maybe closer to 50 or 55. That's something that this digital elevation model will allow us to incorporate back into the data. And this is all, you know, in essence of keeping true angles with respect to the target. That's the purpose of the goniometer, true angles. We don't care what the goniometer is doing with respect to its own frame. We care about what it is with respect to our target. And that's why we have this um, ability to do a digital elevation model with two millimeter accuracy. And we can do it for a predefined area of interest. Um, this is just a notional concept of how it works. Um, but you can, you can change the sizing and the density of that. Another feature is the elevation model. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the elevation model allows for the study of macroscopic surface troubles. So something that Dr. Bachman is uh, interested in with these rates of transfer models is also understanding the macroscopic rubbles. If you're measuring the BRDF of gravel or something like that, um, the height of those objects can induce shadows in, in certain directions that can adjust the reflective information, um, reflective light, and change your BRDF. And since a lot of our sites exhibit this large scale roughness, uh, we wanted to be able to actually describe it with this DPN. We can do that down to, like I said, about, about two millimeters or so. Another one is reduction of cell shading. Um, so, we have an open arc design on the new one. This is actually um, a picture or a model of the new one here. And no stationary overhead structure. Unlike a typical goniometer, which might operate something like this, if your sun is in line with your structure, you'll actually shadow your target almost the entire time. And that limits your information about the opposition effect. Ours was designed such that we can point the, the system towards the sun by having the open portion of the arc towards it so our frame will never shadow. 
the only thing that's overhead is this small arm, which actually is pointing the sensor the whole time. And so you'll be able to get very close to opposition effect, about within two degrees or so. Um, and you're not shadowed during any other portion of the scan. So only when you get very near to the sun could you ever actually have a shadow. Other than that, all the shadows will be behind the, the system. So again, that's what we don't want. What we're trying to get is something where we have minimized sh uh, shadowing and allows us to interrogate the, um, the backscatter of the hotspot. So in order to do this, um, it's been pretty difficult, but we've basically gone to precision engineered components. Um, everything we've done from a custom standpoint has been uh, modeled using finite element analysis. So not only are we understanding, uh, are, are we careful of our choice of motors and things like that, and coders to make sure they're seals and uh, going to operate in all conditions, we also understand the deflections that we're going to see on the system via this finite element analysis. And from this, we're able to design our own frame that was made here in, in Rochester at a company called Trident Precision, which does a lot of precision optical designs. So even though this ring is approximately a meter across, its concentricity is down to 200 micron, which means we have excellent, excellent pointing capabilities versus other going systems. And that basically, you know, tripled all the way down to even the smallest components to make sure that the rigidity was increased um, trying to improve the accuracy for suboptimal terrain. If the system has to level or something on other terrain, we want to make sure that it's rigid enough to keep its own shape, and therefore it's, it's consistent. So again, all of our components were custom manufactured off aluminum. Uh, the system has been assembled now, so it's sitting upstairs on the third floor. It's mechanically operational. We can do all of the motions that I've talked to you about here that allow us to have these great features like target tracking and digital elevation model. Um, what we're working on now is finalizing the control software for the device. So the high level of GUI that the user will actually use is going to control the ASD sensors and, and the GUI alert itself. And that's being finalized um, right now. Our low level control software that actually does all the motions and calculations is already finalized and is currently being tested. The next step for us is to install the two ASD spectrometers uh, and then apply the final coatings, which will be avian black paint because of its low reflectance over the veneer and sphere where we're operating with our uh, field spec force controllers. And then we'll begin the testing uh, and calibration effort after that. So, in conclusion, uh, this is what I told you about today. Um, key features being the things on the new goniometer that we're doing, more mobile, more accurate, fully automated, uh, target tracking, dual view design, elevation model, reduction of self shading. So do you have any questions for me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Um, so it's really cool how you redesigned the new um, grid uh, device, but my question is, you, when you have it up in the field, you don't have the ability to sort of place it on an optical table, and as your separate motors are swinging around, you have shake in the device itself, and as the device is rigid in and of itself, that's right, you on the ground, Absolutely. how do you calibrate for that? Yeah, so that's an important point, and that was one that has actually been brought up before by some of the faculty is also while you're leveling or while the system is, is taking the measurement, how you compensate for any settling that may happen. And that's something we're still thinking about. Um, from the shaking and stuff like that with our stepper motors, what we've done is uh, purchased fully integrated motors that actually have acceleration and deceleration profiles. So we can use those profiles to create nice smooth motions that limit that vibration throughout the system. Um, the settling from um, just motion of the device itself while it's taking a scan is an interesting problem. Um, what we believe we're going to do is make sure that the system always remains level. So if the system does settle after a motion, we're going to re-achieve level. And at least that way our reference plane is correct. We don't suspect that we'll have too much lateral shifting problems because of uh, something I didn't talk about of when the feet are designed, they actually have a spike that goes into the ground and holds it and plants it. So if you're on a slope or something like that, those spikes will be holding the system from wanting to slide down. But yeah, the leveling um, could cause, you know, we could have settling issues that affect the leveling system. That's something we're gonna have to, to work out. We wanna make sure we keep a, a consistent reference plan. It's very important. Okay, thank you.
And now please allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Allison Rettinger. Uh, Dr. Rettinger is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Buffalo Center for Geohazard Studies. Her research includes large-scale experimental volcanology with a focus on magma water interactions. Uh, Allison is a proponent of seizing learning opportunities as they present themselves as her work. It requires a combination of scientific expertise and uh, lots of practical knowledge, including carpentry, landscaping, vacuum repair, and crafts. Uh, she received her PhD from the Department of Geology and Planetary Science at the University of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Rettinger will be presenting on applications of visible and near infrared spectroscopy to volcanology. Actually, I can see the microphone. I'm, I'm just a generally loud person, so we can skip the, the mic this time. <coughs> so, uh, well, I said at the talk, basically, we're going to shift gears completely and go from very technical uh, focus on the specific questions of spectroscopy and going to a bigger picture, okay, we have volcanoes, we want to study them, how can spectroscopy aid in that? And it's um, a multi-tool uh, bearing kit, and it's, it's applied in, in different ways, using different wavelengths, and different questions at different times. So my training is in um, physical geology, I'm a mapper, I look at deposits, and so I've learned to use spectroscopy to aid that. Uh, and I'll give a bit of an overview as well about other applications that aren't from my specific work, but that are volcanology related uh, that might be of interest. Whoop. There we go. Um, so I gave my spiel that goes with this. We're gonna, we're gonna travel around the world, but spend some time in Iceland because it is uh, a place of interest to me because the mention of magma and water, that's the questions that I ask, but uh, ultimately it's the deposits I'm interested in. How can we look at them using different uh, approaches? So when you're interested in a volcanic system, whether you're looking at an active system or one that's erupted in the past, pick your wavelength. You can have a favorite wavelength and look at different elements of the system, or in my preference, I like to combine. So I like the V and I R all the way out through the, the long wave, or to, through infrared in particular. But occasionally I have colleagues who dabble in the, the UV or the, the, the radar that I can take advantage of their expertise. So you can see in these two examples here, uh, just some of the basic interests of why we're looking at volcanoes. And so there's the ash hazard. If you guys remember the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in 2010, uh, that ash plume was very problematic for Europe. So it's not a localized hazard, it's a large scale hazard. So that's why we, we love satellite imagery. Uh, but also then a more recent eruption that happened this past year, also in Iceland, uh, in Hunnefroen, you can see that we're using radar there to map changes in the flow uh, as it grew. And one of the reasons I included this particular image is we're going to return later to this volcano that's actually right next door, that's Askia, one of the few in Iceland that's super easy to pronounce. Um, and we're going to look at the pods along this side here. Volcanoes aren't just on Earth. We can go to many other places, and spectroscopy is our friend because we can't touch it. So uh, this is an example of active volcanism from our solar system. Io is a moon of Jupiter, and there are actively erupting events. We've seen changes. We've seen lava flows appear. There are lava lakes. It's changing over time, and we can monitor this. Uh, one of the instruments that uh, I'll point out just for fun, since this is a, a VNIR group, the, um, the NIMS instrument looks at uh, the, the 0.7 to 5 micron. Um, you can see my bias towards the TIR there that I'll be talking about microns a lot more than I'm talking about uh, you know, uh, when we're jumping around with units. But uh, we can also then look at cryovolcanism. So when we look off Earth, our definition of volcanism is anything that comes from inside the planet out. It doesn't have to be the silicic lava that we think about on Earth. Uh, and we actually have a candidate from Pluto, these new images coming back from the New Horizons mission, where we're seeing regions that might be cryovolcanic. So this feature right here, called Wright Mons, may actually be um, a volcanic, cryovolcanic feature. We, it looks very young. Uh, Stay tuned, there'll be more data, there'll be more wavelengths as it continues to download from the instrument and we'll learn more. Uh, my, my workhorse instrument is ASTER. So the, uh, the satellite has a combination of VNIR bands, 
Um, up until 2008, we had SWEAR. That broke, unfortunately, but the TIR and the, the VNIR still work. So if you're looking at uh, previous past deposits, you can always go back in the archive and take advantage of it. But if you're looking at more active uh, recent events, we can't use the SWEAR. And just um, why some of these wavelengths are interesting in terms of mapping and geology and why um, volcanologists might care, we can see we have our VNIR versus our SWEAR, but some major uh, rock forming units, of course, uh, showing different spectral features in these different wavelengths. And it's a little subtler in the VNIR, a little bit more dramatic in the TIR, but we can still make major distinctions. And I'll get into some of the applications um, with some examples from Iceland I mentioned. Um, the, the data in the US is really easy to get a hold of. There's also an astro-based EDM that's available to everybody. Uh, if you want international data from Astro, it's a bit more work. They want you to put in um, a proposal or work with a collaborator who's part of the instrument team, which is what I do. So for details on that, look on their website because I have uh, collaborators who make my job easier. Um, I also like things like QuickBird. We can go to much higher spatial resolution, which lets us look at more detailed features. Uh, and the important part of QuickBird is that it's not just viz, we also have the IR, the near IR, which lets us start looking at vegetation. And vegetation around volcanoes changes and responds to eruptions and deposit types and can give us a lot of important information about the rocks just by looking at the plant line. Um, there's also pan bands with these. The lighting in here isn't super, I don't know if we can turn it down for some of my imagery, but one of the reasons I stuck this up here is we can see this dark flow here is actually a mud flow. And uh, the, by adding in the IR band, we can actually see the difference between the mud flow here and logging um, human activity that actually has reduced the vegetation in a different area. So when you look at the viz imagery, um, those two little streaks of dark look quite similar. But as soon as we have the IR, we can um, start to differentiate between this fresh, moist flow versus just some bare earth as a result of uh, human activity. Nope, there's an arrow. Ooh, thank you. Just in time, too. So now you can see what I'm talking about. Might be a big dark. Um, I'll try to be excited to keep you awake uh, just so you can appreciate the imagery. Here's a similar one. We're still looking at Mayon Volcano uh, in the Philippines. Similar deposits, but again, the addition of the, the near IR, in this case, is from Worldview. We have more bands available. Um, there's two IR bands, and the resolution's pretty awesome in. in these wavelengths, we can get uh, about two meter uh, resolution from both these instruments, and then the pan band you go down to, to less than a meter, which is really good for picking out specific features that we're interested in. Um, there's also lots of other sensors I haven't covered them all, um, but these are some of the favorites that get used on volcanoes. So anything from the, the alley instrument to Landsat, Econo Spot. If you can put it on a UAV, we love it. If you can uh, get an airborne instrument, that's useful too. So volcanologists tend to take advantage of, we're, we're exploiting any opportunities that are available in instrumentation. So not limited to uh, specific spectral or spatial resolution at any time. And temporal resolution is very important for us. So we will take advantage of any data set that we can get a hold of for our target. Um, now, in terms of the surfaces that we're investigating, they're quite diverse. Um, I have images here of active lava flows, which have their own challenges because uh, an active flow changes, but if you get into different wavelengths in SWIR, you might be saturating and actually not be able to look at it because it's too hot. That's why we need to get to the, the thermal infrared. In the um, other cases, vegetation comes back in quite quickly. So this is this flow over here is only from 1992, and the vegetation has grown over significant components rather quickly. Um, the reason I like to play with different wavelengths and not just be limited to N1 is you can also see here we have an ash plume and then meteoric clouds, and depending on um, your instrument and, and what windows you have, they can be quite hard to, to pick out. So the more wavelengths you have available, the better you can target it. And the final image is just, this is a very practical sort of approach. We need to know where something is going, say ash in the atmosphere, uh, where it is currently, where it has been in the past, things like that. So a lot of it is detection recognition of, of different surfaces, and then also detecting change. Change is the big one, especially if you're looking at an ongoing eruption. So here's just another 
uh, specific application. These are two images from the Astro image in the, the it's just the RGB from the, the viz, and then also contrast with the, uh, the square over here. And the vegetation, different flows, we can actually see some of the SO2 gas in the viz which uh, is not being picked up in this particular instrument. But if you go out into the TIR at 8.3 microns, you can start to pick up SO2 again. Um, so the contrast of different wavelengths and different images are, are very useful for detecting different things. We, we like these wavelengths because the silicate minerals pop up, uh, specific iron oxides, or um, if we go up to sphere, we can start to get clays. That's important for hydrothermal alteration. So, all of those different elements can come up as spectrally unique. We can map them, we can watch them change over time, things like that. And that's the ultimate goal, is to see what the system did in the past, what the system's doing right now, and then we might be able to say something about what it'll do in the future. So here's just an example of change detection. We're not just talking hot things, we also look at uh, mud flows. That's actually where I started my research. And this is an example from 2007 using the Aster instrument again. And you can just see how well the flow path uh, picked up from the lahar. It's pointed out there with the yellow notes that immediately afterwards, a very fresh deposit's pretty easy to pick up. So when you have change, that's if you have a nice uh, baseline understanding of what the system was, lots of imagery, we can better pick out changes like that. We can also look for more subtle variations. So this is some work from one of my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh um, at Ramsey is looking at Augustine Volcano in Alaska, and these are pyroclastic flow deposits. So you can see in this image up here, there's a whole sort of um, debris fan. Think of it like a, an alluvial fan, nothing but pyroclastic deposits. So multiple flows, lots of small flows over time building up material. And then using uh, repeat imagery, you can then look for how much has this changed and trying to quantify that change to say something about the deposit types, the deposit volumes, things of that nature. So this on the left is just an unsupervised classification of viz imagery from the Aster instruments of those three bands and just showing the unique um, spectral groupings on the system. And then if you just pick one of the bands, so this is band three, and over the three years of the data availability, looking at how that changed over time. So this might be compaction, this could be a, a cooling effect, it could be um, redistribution of material from wind and rain. We have lots of variables in this system. So first step is, where is it changing? And then, as field geologists, my favorite part is we run in and we can go poke at it and see what's changing and why, and then recalibrate the system. So the next time it happens, we might have a better arsenal of um, approach for, for solutions for what might be changing. Here's just a, an idea of some of the diversity of the, the land surfaces that we're interested in. In some cases, you can see that we just have uh, color variation. We have steep slopes a lot of the time. Um, here's hot rock next to cold rock. You can have um, all of this material is predominantly the same composition, but you can see grain size and texture is very different within that image. Um, we can have compositional variations over different scales. This is actually the crystal size scale. We're now in the millimeters. Uh, or centimeter size change, so 10 centimeter size change in this image. We do have vegetation. Not Volcanoes don't kill everything. Uh, sometimes it returns quite rapidly, and you also have water. It's a, it's a steep slope system, so it's very dynamic. There's lots of elements contributing to our spectra. Um, and this is an image where everything is actually really similar in composition, but still texturally different. So here's a case study for now. Um, at a volcano in the U.S. This was uh, an eruption in Colorado. It's the youngest volcano in Colorado. And you can see there's a crater feature here. This is a specific type of volcano called a mar that's the result of an eruption um, from rising magma meeting water, and you have a very explosive eruption in the ground. So what you're doing is excavating a hole in the pre-existing rock. So inside the crater, this red is just the original material. It's a sandstone. It's not volcanic. Where did the deposits go? So that's the big question, is where is the ash and the tephra that was produced by this eruption? First glance, our grad student comes back and says, oh, I think all of this lovely material over here might be ash. It's 5,000 years old, it's an arid environment. We shouldn't have a lot of soils, that kind of made sense. We went in the field, um, and here's our crater again. We dug some pits of the proximal deposits, so we're on the crater rim, we know it's related to the volcano. 
And then we start looking for the ash elsewhere. And we found this instead. It's, a, it's actually a burn scar, which is also common in the desert. So the, the answer was, or the question came, well, where did this ash go? And we sent a graduate student out. He had so much time. Go dig some holes. Because back, I dug a lot of holes. I can't find the ash. So remote sensing and spectroscopy is now the next step. OK, the ash has to be there somewhere. Uh, and what has happened as a result is that I'm actually suspicious of this age. If it's only 5,000 years old, is there a significant soil on top? Is that why we can't find it? Or was it blown away? And we, we need to keep looking for it to find that out. So just first run pulling out the aster viz, looking for spectral diversity in this scene. Um, here's the crater for reference that doesn't actually have a, a spectrum coming off of it. We only have three bands in the aster here, but it's pretty easy to see there's some diversity with that host, that red sandstone that I pointed out. Um, there's some vegetation, the scrub that's sort of come back in and grown. And then this area where we thought the ash was, we actually have two different looking spectra. They're not hugely different, but what this does is gives me some place to send that poor graduate student. So he's not trying to cover this whole scene. He's trying to get to targeted areas and look for um, ash that hopefully is there. If not, um, we'll keep investigating and look for a different mechanism. So a more complete study that actually has a bit more of an answer than that last one takes us to Iceland. So this is that volcano Askja that I mentioned, uh, the Hulahrun eruption that I mentioned before. That's just this last year. We sort of be poking into this imagery if I had a newer, a newer image. So it's kind of fun to watch that because my volcano was always in the background on TV. They weren't talking about it. Um, anyway, so the the surface at this volcano has a lot of diversity. I sort of showed you some. Earlier. This is a pumice in the foreground, so it's high silica content over the basalt, which is a lower silica content, more iron and magnesium. We also have snow. This is the center of Iceland, so even in uh, August, where these images were collected, the snow does not go away. Some years the snow didn't go away at all, um, and you would actually not be seeing the rocks, period. So it makes it kind of difficult for the, the duration of the study. At the time, there's only one image in all of the Astor Archive. From, from 99 onward that had a clear shot of this volcano. Recently, there's been a second image. I'm kind of excited. I'll go back and look at it again. Um, but there's also here some long flow in the foreground. This is made of the same material. This is basalt, but it's fragmental. So very different textural signature. And the goal was to go in, look at the rocks, find the diversity of lithology. What are our different rock types? What's making up this feature? And then can I say something about the nearby volcanoes calibrated off of this one detailed field study. Because I don't have time or money to do a detailed study <coughs> on every volcano. And maybe one or two might be um, really ideal to go back and look at. So here's Askia at the bottom. Um, all of these other lumps and, and high topographic features are mapped as the same stuff. They all say magma and water interacted. There was a glacier here. We had very interesting eruptions. That's all we're going to say. I'm very interested in those details that they rushed over. So the goal is to take one volcano and extrapolate that and see what we can say about the others. Um, so once I found this lithological diversity, take end members, bring back these end members, create a spectral library, and then use those end members to do classifications and see if we can't produce a map from there. So here's just an idea of some of the, the diversity and the awesome landscape that is Iceland. I'm always an, an advertising for tourism to Iceland is an orange place. Um, and you can see this is the map that's produced. So this sort of uh, arcuate shape here is the area that I mapped. Previous maps along to this as purple. So all of these, um, these massifs that I'm talking about are lumped in now as, as subglacial. And I want to pull out some of this diversity. These are some examples of the end members that I brought back to the lab. This is basaltic, this is basaltic, this is basaltic, this is basaltic. But you can see that while the composition is fairly similar and overlaps, there's a lot of textural differences. And at least in some cases, you also have alteration features. So this is starting to break down into a clay called palagonite, sort of a family of clays with a funky material. It's all over Mars, so we're also interested in, uh, in terms of other planets. This is a rhyolite, and this is a rhyolite, but again, very different texturally, and also one's altered. So um, those were my basic end members. And here's just an example from the um, from this collecting the hyperspectral. It was a, a field spec. Did this in the lab. Very short path length. No worry about changes in, in atmosphere. Nice calibration. And you can see that the rhyolites sort of lump together. There's this uh, the lava versus the pumice, and then the basalts lump together. But we have some slight variability as a result of that texture here in the fizz. 
It's more dominant in the TIR, which I did the exact same thing, and then we resample it for the Astra instrument. So we have calibrated hyperspectral data from the field, and then we take this back to our um, few bands of satellite imagery and look for our targets. So first pass sort of lets do some unsupervised classifications as well. And you can see this is just the RGB, but then we have some features that start to stand out. This is your lake. Um, the lake feature stands out again for uh, in all of the images. And you can see sort of systematic, uh, there's, there's important features that keep standing out no matter how we try and classify the image. So they are spectrally unique and then possibly lithologically unique. Um, there's this sort of swathy feature that I'll draw your attention to. Um, and then there's blue everywhere in this image. There's a lot of similar features in the field. And really, geologically, there's some, some consistent themes. There's volcanic rocks um, of two types, so basaltic and, and rhyolic, as, as you've seen from the previous images. Uh, and then there's all this redistributed sand from aeolian processes or glaciers and things like that and then odd bits of vegetation poking out in water. But when we get to uh, the, the, cl the supervised classification where we're using these N members, we can actually pick out specific, this, this region here where I mapped is highly spectrally diverse, just like I was seeing in the field. And so these more consistent areas then stand out for being more, uh, more consistent. But here's another highly complex unit. Here's a more complex unit. This over here is spectrally complex as well. And those are those previously just mapped as purple subglacial volcanic. So that was kind of an exciting outcome. So there's, now they're pink. I'm sorry, I was calling them purple the whole time, but I've swapped it in the map for you. But all these other blobs that were just mapped, oh, it's a subglacial volcano. Um, and this is the area I mapped. Then when we combine these multiple wavelengths and using supervised and unsupervised classifications, looking for consistency in, um, these groupings and a little bit of manual interpretation, we end up with a final map where I, there are two major groups in these purples that get broken down, and that's the fragmental versus the non-fragmental units, which is actually very important from a volcanological standpoint in terms of how that erupted. So is it explosive or not explosive? That's always a good question. Another important thing that we drew out of this, you can see this yellow, and the viz was actually really key in pulling this out, was that pumice that covered up a lot of the areas I was interested in. So I wanted to understand the eruptions that were made in salt, but in 1875 there was this large eruption that blanketed everything in pumice. Now it made things accessible. I could climb much steeper hills as a result because pumice makes for nice climbing, but it did also make it more difficult to do remote sensing over this feature here. So being able to determine where that pumice was remotely currently, not just where it had been initially after the eruption, which is a nice isopack of continuous deposits. So we can start to pick out some of this complexity of nearby features. We can pick out complexity on a feature that I already knew was complex. Ground-based opportunities in volcanology are sort of endless, and this is a realm that we're starting to break into using a range of hyperspectral instrumentation. But basically the goal is you go up to a vertical face and you say, aha, it is made of many diverse things. I don't have enough time to repel down that and collect every single unit, though I'd love to, it's fun. Um, if we get a few calibrated, you know, end members, the way, same way I did for the, the satellite-based work, then if I can collect, you know, one or two spots, then we can come up with a map of what's going on this using um, uh, various imagery and different wavelengths. And the same for this, and we can then unravel how that particular series of deposits was in place, which gets us back to processes, which gets us back to hazards, which is ultimately one of the big goals of volcanology. We want to know how, why, how much, etc. And then uh, the reason that my introduction include discussion of carpentry and uh, vacuums and things like that is we do large-scale experiments at the University of Buffalo. This is a, a geohazards center that's basically been doing volcanoes right now. So anybody else who's hazard interested, we have this large facility. It doesn't just have to be volcanoes. It's a user facility where people can come in and make a mess. The mess that we've made has involved dynamite, and at the moment we're melting our own lava. So that gives you an idea of how much of a mess we can make. Earth moving is not a problem. Um, make your own dunes over a certain size, whatever, totally possible, and then you can have a certain level of calibration at a larger scale than you can get in the laboratory. But 
where spectroscopy is starting to play a role there. As you can see, it's mostly in the IR based on these sort of overly colorful imagery. But um, introducing additional wavelengths is just one of the ways that we can quantify these processes. And they're at a larger scale, they're slightly messier. If you ever want to test an instrument, we've actually done a lot of that. So some of our colleagues have done a lot of work of refining their high-speed thermal infrared cameras using our processes. Uh, we had other people doing um, geophysical testing, stuff like that. And then just for fun, because there's an explosion in the middle, I'll point out what we're looking at. So these two are an explosion, this is in the IR, this is what it is. Um, then there's this lava flow furnace. At the moment, I'm just basically going, where are we losing heat? I'm not even looking at uh, specifics of the, the spectra yet. Um, and so that's the furnace, just with a regular picture, and my colleague wearing a silver suit. We made ourselves a little lava cake. You know when you go to a restaurant and they give you a molten lava cake and you cut it open and goo comes out? I did that with real lava. That was like last week. I'm pretty excited about that. Anyway, we can look at these different little lava flows that ooze out the side and the temperature, and so I have temperature profiles to go with it. And I can, I'm very interested in the mixing of the sediment and the lava, and temperature is an important part of that. And so I can use different wavelengths to look at it texturally. I can also use those to, to measure these temperature profiles. So um, there's a lot of different ways to play with um, the electromagnetic spectrum and, and, and volcanoes. So sort of summary for if you were to learn anything about what, what volcanologists care about in terms of uh, using remote sensing and spectroscopy, it's just locating future areas to go study. We can't study them all. How do we narrow that down? Uh, change detection that we can do remotely, and we can study a lot more places that way. We're ultimately interested in deposit sizes, but also deposit characterization. So quite interested in discussions about grain size and different mechanisms of being able to, to identify that. Um, using spectroscopy. And then um, vegetation health, I mentioned before, is one of our, our key tools. So if you put this in sort of um, the hazards perspective, you can take it into um, ash, crops, and livestock. So how does that crop respond to being covered in ash or being um, affected by SO2 gas and other toxic gases from volcanoes? Where is that ash? How is it going to kind of plain avoid it? Uh, and and the, the viz through TIR rank is really key to this ash problem. Um, gas seeps, so sometimes gas comes out of the ground not at the vent, and the easiest way to find that is remotely. You can look for vegetation health, so um, the, the, the near air is very important for that. And then thermal anomalies, or watching where snow is, was, and where it might be if you put hot stuff on it and it melts and wants to run downhill. So it's sort of um, a lot of people's careers mashed into a short thing and, and, and a few of the bits of how I use it myself. But if you're always interested in branching out and uh, taking your spectroscopy knowledge, there's, there's volcanologists who probably love to work with you. Um, and I'll take any questions. everybody. Um, so that concludes our morning session. We have lunch prepared for you in the fishbowl that's out to the left of, as you exit the auditorium. And then we will be back in this room at 1 p.m. with Dr. Phil Thank you.